Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I want to sort of check in where Canada is today. And John Wright, uh, the executive vice president of Maru Public Opinion, is my guest tonight. Uh, John is uh, a, a real great follower of politics. He's an individual that understands polling and uh, statistics, and he uh, publishes on a fairly frequent basis really good write-ups of what the polls say and what they mean. So, John Wright, welcome to the show, sir. Good to be with you, Brian. Uh, my pleasure. So you ha you most recently talked about the federal budget and uh, whether it had taken the economy in the right direction or the wrong direction. And what was the conclusion of your poll? Well, we've been tracking how Canadians feel about certain aspects of the economy since April of 2020. Now, I've been in working in the public opinion field for 35 years. In fact, the first economic confidence poll I put together was back in 1990. And there have been a series of different ones. It seems that, you know, whenever I get interested in an area, I start something new. But this one was started during COVID. And I think that's really, really critical that we had a baseline during COVID to see if anything would change from there. And plus, it's a very extensive list of 22 questions. It's not just a few here or there. And it culminates in an index. But Brian, what, what I think if you had to step back from all of this, and I do it in Canada, the United States, and Great Britain is very, very similar, is that the commentary nowadays is the disconnect between how the economy is actually doing and how people feel. So the economy, if you listen to it even in the last week or so, is just going great guns. I mean, we have just slightly higher unemployment that we've had um, you know, over the last number of years but not that much. GDP is working just fine. Gross domestic product has slowed a little bit, but it's still good for the economy. We have interest rates, which are starting to come down the long-term interest rates. We don't see it yet in any cuts in the, the basis points, but it's in the cards. We have the stock market, which in fact blew the doors off over the last week or so in the anticipation that the United States is going to start reducing interest rates. I mean, if you had a dashboard for where the plane is functioning and where it's it, it's it, it's going to um, make sure that it's running in the right direction, you would be looking at a plane that's going really well and, and wouldn't have much maintenance. But in terms of its direction, it's completely different. You've got 69% of the people in this country believing that the economy is headed in the wrong direction. So despite all of those things, they think it's bad. They, you know, six in 10 to almost two thirds of the public believes that either the local or the national economy isn't going to uh, improve anytime soon. And if you go all the way back to April of 2020 and you ask, are you struggling to make ends meet? You'd find 27% there where you'd find 41% today. So this disconnect, people are, you know, there are lots of people who say, well, how can that be? I might hear, I'll give you my theory. Please. It's called, the, I'm going to name it the Dickinsonian theory. And that is during COVID, we were in the worst of times, but we were in the best of times. So there we are, locked in our homes, can't go out, starting to learn how to work uh, um, on hybrid, but the car's in the driveway, so we're not spending anything there on, on money. We're getting, you know, that the food deliveries coming in with the big box and the fresh food, so we're not spending a lot of money there. We don't have the expenses, so our bank accounts are filling up. We've got the lowest interest rates. In fact, at one point, negative interest rates. We've got people knocking on our door, willing to buy our houses for an astronomical amount of money. And then COVID ends. And we start to see that bank account go down. And we see the inflation that's gone up. And as it starts to come down, because interest rates are going up, we basically swap out where interest rates are high and grocery prices stay high. So our world has changed in a drastic way. We've gone from one type of economy to a COVID to now a COVID reckoning. But where we are right now, if you take a look at all the dashboards, we're kind of back to about 2019 before this all started, but we feel terrible about it. And we want to blame somebody for it. And guess what? It's the current government that's getting the, you know, the short end of the stick. So I think that's the disconnect, despite the fact that we've got in all three of those countries I talked about pretty good economic range of where we're headed, but our pocketbooks and our, ourselves, we feel like we've been gypped out of something that we had just a couple of years ago. Now, some people are suggesting it's because of the opposition politicians that are that are describing us as being in a very bad economic situation and blaming it all on the leaders. And you hear this in the United States and, and in Canada. Is that it, or is it that we're actually feeling worse off? Well, I, I think you can actually say that we are worse off in some pocketbook ways. I mean, 
if you went to, uh, you know, Mr. Polyev is out banging the drum again about the carbon tax. Uh, you know, we've got a fresh blend of gasoline that makes prices go up in the summer anyways. But you see in some places it's up to a dollar. Uh, it's up to what is it? A buck ninety nine a liter or something like that, or maybe even more so in some places. You've got um, grocery prices which are coming down, but you're spending on average for a family of four close to thirteen hundred dollars more than you were. A year ago, anywhere between eight hundred and nine hundred to thirteen hundred dollars, and so it feels like we are spending more. In fact, we are on those base and and essential things that we have in the economy that we have to make our families, you know, grow and prosper. We also find it difficult to get wage increases. That hasn't happened. Uh, even the modest amounts that have been made in both Canada and the United States have not managed to keep up with the inflation that, in fact, has overtaken most of the people who are here. So we do feel that difference. What has happened, however, is that in both of those countries, the anger that people have about that circumstance has then be turned into proxy votes. So if you feel bad about the economy and you want to and you and you want to um, take it out on somebody. That's where that happens, where people say, "I feel badly. I'm going to take it out on the politician who's leading this country," and and then you get the opposition who amps it up. So we do feel badly about what we've lost. Even credit debt is now at a, a, almost an entirely different level than it ever has been before, and that's because we're spending more money to keep up with what we had during the pandemic. But what we can't get today because of inflation and interest rates. You described it as playing handball with a wet blanket. Yeah. So let's let's describe it uh, in terms of this latest budget. You and I have been around politics for a long time. And we know that there's certain messaging that has to take place. And you know that budgets, I remember a time, and you do too, when if a uh, uh, if a finance minister was putting his new shoes on the desk and a number from the budget happened to be in the view of a reporter, it could almost cost him his job. What we have now is a rollout of the budget three weeks in advance. So it, it's a little bit like doing a speech. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them. Tell them what you told them and then sit down. So the liberals roll it out over three weeks and are, they're saying we're going to do all this stuff. They stand up in the House. They decide that they're going to do it. The objective is to get people to to do three things. Number one, connect with the liberals if you're middle class, because that's what they think. That's their mantra. The problem with that, of course, is that if 85 percent of the people think that they are middle class in this country and they don't think you're serving them well, well, you're not going to get a lot of kudos for that. Secondly, you want to zero in and say, I'm going to take some money away for the rich people in order to balance off for the less fortunate or the middle class in this country. So you do that. And the last thing is you've got a whole bunch of things you've laid out for those young people with housing and all those starts and older people who you want back on the voting with the dental pieces. You've got all the goodies in the basket. You stand up. And then for the next two weeks, you're dealing with capital gains taxes. And so you end up having the rich people in this country really pissed off at you, but the rest of them don't hear the message. So when I went back and field, which was about 10 to 12 days after the budget took place, if the idea was to have that budget make people more confident about you in managing the economy, make them feel more, um, more likely that they are going to believe the national economy is going to improve and give you some credit for it, it absolutely didn't happen. In fact, everything tanked across the entire spectrum. And, and a liberal cabinet minister or representative will probably say, look, John, it takes a while for these things to get through. And, and you know, we have to let them roll out before people are able to see whether or not we've helped them. If you say that, then you're kind of denying the exercise you went through, and that is to frame the budget as something that's going to help you. I mean, the whole message was, we're coming to save your life and do something better for you. And you'd expect the numbers to go up when, in fact, they tanked right across the board. So my view on that was, A, it failed miserably, and B, it was a little bit like playing handball against a wet blanket. I mean, there it was, boom, and about 10 days later, you got nothing to show for it, except you've still got the headache of a, national, of a capital gains tax which has nothing to do with most of the people in this country. So you don't think it resonated that uh, we're soaking the rich? Well, I think that there's there are there are people within the polling who actually are seeing a, an optimism, but that optimism was there before the budget. And I'll tell you who is optimistic. 44% of uh, Gen, Z, Gen Zs. I mean, young people are optimistic. Why? 
well, a lot of them are not paying what you and I are paying. A lot of them are, you know, either home uh, and they're, you know, in their jobs that they can, they don't have to pay rent. They don't have to pay the taxes. They don't have to pay the cost of living that other people are doing. Half of them feel like they've got the tail, uh, you know, of the world and that they're going ahead. They're also doing virtual uh, new kind of digital nomad jobs. I mean, I don't want to lump them into the same place, but when you get half of them looking optimistic and you get everybody else who's actually earning money or trying to spend the money that they've saved in a prudent way, feeling really badly, there's an imbalance there. So the Trudeau government, let's take it back to base politics. Trudeau government looks at the landscape, I think, and you're probably a better view, uh, a better uh, uh, prognosticator on this as anybody. How we used to see getting a majority government was with either 37 or 38 percent of the national poll. That was it. Get that, you get a majority. So that was 2015. If you cycle forward, what the Trudeau government has effectively learned is, if I can get the NDP to stick with me, I only need 34 percent. Because that's the way the balance turns out. You end up with 34. I end up with a minority, but I can rule the country as if it's a majority. And so, you know, people have speculated, will the NDP pull the plug? The reality is they won't. Why would you do that? You would lose all the influence you're ever going to have. And plus, the liberals will probably get wiped out if they go to the polls today. So you're hanging on for another many more months. But what that means, Brian, is you don't have to work that hard for that 37 or 38 percent. So you can you just cater to numbers. your uh, base. Pardon me? So you can just cater to your base. You, no, no, no. The, the base for the liberals is about 27 to 28. So you need to bring on some more people if you want to make over that ledge. If you get 39 percent who believe that the economy is headed in the right direction, if you get that group of people feeling better that you're leading the economy, plus you get the wedge issues in there, then you've got a group of people that you can work with. Right now, the Liberals are sitting at about 26 to 28% in the polls, which is not helping them at all. And plus, now they've got negative numbers on how the economy can be managed and whether they can get any credit for them. So again, they've gone through this big exercise. If it had been working, they probably would have ridden it. But what did they do in the last week? Out comes the abortion wedge issue. Out comes, you know, Mr. Polyev is going to be like Mr. Trump next door and take away all your rights. So the wedge issues are coming out because the other stuff didn't work. And we're back into the summer now. We'll have to see whether or not the liberals who have said that they're going to see whether the economy, whether their own numbers pick up by July, uh, actually believe that the prime minister should hang in. I think it's not going to be before August that any kind of leadership decision is is going to be made. But if I look at the prime minister today, I can't see him going anywhere for the anytime soon. We're chatting with John Wright, Amari Public Opinion. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more on his recent polling of how we feel about the economy in just two minutes. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saginaw and Sexy. I've got John Wright. He's the executive vice president of uh, Maori Public Opinion. He's recently released the Canadian Maori Household Outlook Index, uh, which is a 60-day uh, outlook about the Canadian economy and people's personal finances. And, and effectively, what you're saying is people didn't like the budget, and uh, they're feeling really crappy about uh, the economy going forward. And I was, I was surprised about that, um, because I think that you're right, that there was a surprising amount of different measures within the budget to try to appeal to people. And it just doesn't sit, sit well with people. Uh, let me ask you a couple of questions if I could, you know, you talked about how you used to be able to wait. You used to have to wait until budget day before you announced everything. And uh, you know, maybe for three weeks, but, but certainly for one week, they focused almost every day on housing uh, issues. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of the budget um, at least uh, on budget day, the speech was about housing uh, inaffordability, trying to appeal to young people. And I think, uh, the statistics are that if uh, in Trudeau's first election, when was that? 2015? I can't even remember now. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, 2015. If you yeah. go back there, if if it, if the young people hadn't turned out, Harper would have won that uh, that race. Right. Uh, so if the same people had come out uh, had come out in the previous election, uh, Trudeau would not have run, but won. But what he did is he motivated a whole bunch of new people to come out, and those were primarily uh, newcomers to Canada, as well as young people. And uh, those young people voted en masse for Trudeau. And some people think it was because of decriminalization and legalization of marijuana. Um, do you think that he was trying to do the same thing with all the housing stuff, trying to appeal to young people? And in your polling, do you segment into young people 
And did it work with young people? Well, you raise a lot of really good points. First of all, if we remember back to the 2015 election, Harper was winning at the outset of the campaign, but lost in the final 10 days. There was an interesting twist about 10 days near the end of the campaign. And that is that, remember, Mr. Trudeau was showing him walking up a reversed escalator. You know, I'm trying to get up the top and make some change for you. Help me along the way. But the liberals did something that absolutely cut through to young people was they gave them hope. I mean, that's what the last 10 days was all about. You know, it was a full double page spread in the newspapers before we were always doing digital. And it had Mr. Trudeau overlooking a crowd and with his hand up and saying, you know, we have hope for the future. So it was about the environment. It was, a you know, a juxtaposed Mr. Harper, which didn't have much there. It was about talking to young Canadians. It was about the middle class and, and housing to get to that that level. OK, those people brought him on board. But where are they today? We've been eight years into this mandate and we've got them who who voted when they were 18, now 26 or older. Right. So they've got different priorities today and all the things you promised back then maybe haven't come true. And you want to have change directed at you and maybe you want somebody who's going to have a different way of expressing what now is anger that you're not getting what you promised. It's pretty hard for Mr. Trudeau to go back and kind of loop those people in because they haven't got what they thought they would have. A lot of those, you know, Gen X's don't have um, the, uh, or millennials, a lot of them haven't owned homes, right? Like they haven't. So it's a different pitch. And what I find, Brian, is that the, the government is kind of pitching the new world, but with a lot of the old world. You know, if they've gone back to, if you look at all the budgets, it's all been about hitting the middle class, right? Like every every title has been about the middle class. I don't think that resonates anymore. I think that if you were going to try and put a budget together that actually has something in it for everybody, then you're not going to satisfy anybody at all. Like everybody's, you know, it's just a mess. I do, however, think that, they did put three weeks of good communication into this. They rolled it all out. But the, within hours of them having that budget out, they were back on their heels dealing with something that only the most wealthy in this country deal with. And that's the capital gains tax. They were attacked by doctors. They were attacked by families with cottages on Lake Rosso in the Muskokas. I mean, they were they were attacked by people that took them off their game. And I think that caused them a problem where they couldn't communicate to that group of young people that they want to get in here, it just evaporated. So you're back to where you were about two months ago. So I, I don't think for the most part, people pay attention to politics that much. You and I do, but most young people are looking at their aspirations of owning a house or, or having a better job or getting a raise or doing those sort of things. And they're in the day-to-day -day weeds they pop their heads up when they hear a whole lot of noise coming from the politicians, which the Trudeau government had, and then it went away. So I guess the only thing you can say is the Trudeau government is going to deliver on those promises over the next period of time. And if they start to get credit for those things, maybe it'll turn five or 6% of the population who is now offside with them back onside. I think that's what they're hoping, but that's a little more of a long game than a short game. Uh, Pierre Polyev, the leader of the official opposition, uh, the leader of the Conservative Party, has been criticized of late that all he's doing is opposing uh, and, and making negative comments about uh, Trudeau and about the government, not actually saying what he would do. Do people care? I don't think they do at this stage. And I think it's become, you know, he can get criticized for that. But I mean, the Liberals did the same thing in the last previous, you know, in the in the election against Harper. You know, it, it's it's a kabuki show. You, you know, your job as an opposition leader is to oppose. That's the first thing you do. So whether you like it or not, you oppose it. Number two, you're not going to soften on the government. He picked he picked the target. And the target is it's about carbon taxes and the prime minister. So that combination. So even when we don't have the carbon tax to talk about anymore, really, because it's in the rearview mirror, he's out standing in front of a gas station saying, Given us, give us a tax holiday, right? Thirdly, his talking points are so razor edged and so focused that if I asked him what he wanted for dinner tonight, I think I'd just get, well, we would have this, but Mr. Trudeau has taxed that. Like, I wouldn't even get a straight answer on it. So you're not going to get a compromise on any of this stuff from him because that's his job. Number two is 
it's working for him so far, right? Like since the time he started doing this with a combination of how Trudeau's seen, Mr. Trudeau's numbers have, have gone straight down. So it's working. And number three, he doesn't have to tell Canadians what he's got until the election campaign. And even then he may have to, like Doug Ford did in the province of Ontario, he didn't tell people what, what, what they were actually going to get. He's riding a wave of anger. And people want to take it out on somebody. And right now he's got Mr. Trudeau lined up that way. Once he gets into power, I don't know what he's going to deliver. But frankly, that's the only thing that uh, the Trudeau government has on him right now is saying you don't know what he's going to get. So you might get Donald Trump next door and you'll get, you know, abortion will be back on the on 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 the road. I'm not sure those things are making much headway at the moment. John, if if you're you know, if there's this great anger and, and as you say, he's riding this wave of anger. Why are turnouts so low, you know, not only federally, but provincially and municipally? Why why do so few people go to the ballot box? Well, every, it depends on the election campaign. I mean, the last time there was a provincial election campaign, we'd come through COVID and there really wasn't a choice for people. I mean, they kind of looked around and said, all oh, right, Doug's done an OK job. Plus, I'm tired of politics. So that was one part of that. Secondly, if you're referring even to the, the, the latest by-elections in Ontario, you'd look at places like like Milton, people haven't turned, you know, you didn't have huge turnout for something like that. The Conservatives managed to take that. I would suggest to you that you go to other parts of the country and you especially into the Maritimes. And what you're seeing in the provincial election campaigns down there is that the federal Conservatives are running their messages. And guess what? They're winning. They, they're undercutting the Liberals in the Maritimes where it counts and that they are, it's the provincial government that's using it. So you don't see it here in, in Ontario. I think that what draws people to any ballot is anger and fear. And right now you got way more anger than you've got fear out there. And Mr. Trudeau is going to actually, you know, he'll give the fear and the hope on one side, but you've got a whole lot of people who I said have come out of COVID, think they've been cheated out of something, want some change. And guess what? There's an incumbent in the office that Mr. Polyev wants out and they're with him. You and I had a really interesting conversation uh, during the trucker convoy in uh, Ottawa. And uh, you had said 15% of Canadians actually support what they were doing. And I was you know, really interesting what you had to say, because what you said, and I tend to agree with it, is that 15% is a significant number. It's not a majority, but it's a pretty strong, you know, minority, mm -hmm. and that they should have been listened to. And I agree with you. And I really wonder if the prime minister had done a better job of listening, of actually talking to people and, and hearing what they had to say, or if we had a system of proportional representation or something like that, such that Maxine Bernier and his party had a couple of seats in the House of Commons, whether things might be different. And so I guess my bottom line is, do you think that the prime minister has made a big mistake by by almost doing what Hillary Clinton did by, you know, talking about the, uh, what was her word that she used? The, uh, not irredeemable. What was it? It was, oh, I can't remember now, but she just, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. I, you know what? I, I, I don't have any partisan bent in this, so I just kind of look at it. Uh, uh, Forty-five years of being around politics, whether it be you know starting in the par as a parliamentary intern in Ontario and then going from there. This is a prime minister who does a few things. Number one, focuses primarily on domestic issues, even when he's abroad. It's all focused back, and it's all through the lens of what the Liberals have had and they've put out since day one. Number two is there's a lot of promises, but not a lot of delivery. You know, it's kind of like amortized over the next 20 years or so. And what happens is that they announce something, then a year later they re-announce it, and then a year later after that they're announcing it again. Like there's there, there's a sense that things don't get done. I don't want to underestimate the fact that we are in the reckoning of the COVID pandemic. We are sitting right now, even in the city of Toronto, where the mayor has come out and said it's going to cost $26 billion over the next 10 years just to keep things where you are. And I I think that the conversation the prime minister could be having with, with different municipalities to go through this together could be combined with the provincial ministers. They could probably work some things out, but that's not the way he's played. So, Brian, I come back to you. I don't know whether or not he could have alleviated what happened with the truckers being so razor sharp edged against him and the fallout that the conservative party was able to pick up and to keep Maxine Bernier's people with them. But this is what I do know. 
that rather than try and find those compromising parts, rather than recognizing that we're going through a reckoning and trying to find some way of moving the municipalities through some of this in, in, a, in a more structured way, they, they keep coming back to what I said in the first place, and that is 34% of the public matters. That's all they need. You're, you're, not, you're not in the era of the Bill Davis old generation where you sit around the table and you and you do what you do. What what this prime minister tend to, tends to do is we've got right now in the province of Ontario, the numbers for the Bloc Quebecois are huge. You know, there's almost a, an acquiescence to the separatism movement going on there. Um, he's It's one thing to acknowledge that Quebec is recognized in the constitution. It's another thing to say, well, they're also, you know, they can use the notwithstanding clause. They can do a series of other things that, that can take the country apart. I, I, again, I don't want to be all over the map on this, but I think what's happened is that he focuses in only on a narrow wedge of the public rather than the broader group. And that broader group also contains listening about those truckers who were really angry about a whole bunch of things at the time. So I, I would argue that, again, very domestic, very sharp edged, very um, like glass shards of how politics is being played by him and he's getting it back in spades. So I, I don't, I wish I could go back to where things were 20 years ago where there was more compromise and where there was more putting things together for a greater group and managing the country. But if all you're gonna do is split by sharp edges, then you're gonna get cut along the way. You and I met um, in high school where you were uh, president of the Students' Council. And, uh, and you I were was, too. You I were was too. a couple of years after you, I was president of the Students' Council. Um, politics was different then. I was at a really interesting uh, presentation by Jeff Rubin, a former chief economist at CIBC uh, the other day and his new book. And he described the current liberal government as one of the most left-wing tax and spend governments in history. And he was really describing it as far more left-wing than past liberal governments. Um, you know, when you and I were in politics back in high school, you could be a blue liberal or a, a red Tory. Um, have we changed politics? Has it polarized a lot more today? Well, I'd say two things. Number one is that Karl Rove really started all of this in the United States when um, there had actually been a survey done by uh, Angus Reid. It was uh, Desmond Morton did it. It was of university professors in the United States, and it showed that most of them were liberal thinking. And it also showed that a lot of them communications and media were a pretty liberal biased and Democrat liberal. And as a result, Karl Rove basically said, we have to create messaging on the other side. So we need we need a station like Fox News. We need to have communication that's more sharp edge. We need to clean out some of the institutions that have a lot of people who are just liberal so that we can get a voice out there. Now, he he said years later, I wish I hadn't done what I did because it, it really did shape politics in a particular way. But that's what's happened in this country, too. So, you know, the knives have been sharpened on both sides. But I would argue that the principal secretary to Kathleen Wynne, Dalton McGinty, Jerry Butts, had a view of the world and sort of Katie Telford in Ontario, which was, let's tack as far to the left as possible. Let's take it in the NDP. And if we do so, we'll ride that train all the way through to the station. Kathleen Wynne got absolutely decimated because people were fed up with the tax and spend there and the deficit there was. But you see the same game plan federally, right? Like you, you see that it's the NDP and the liberals on one side, the conservatives, it's the liberals that have done that. That's part of the strategy. That is part of what they are reaping at the moment. Nobody else did that in this country. They decided to do that. We have lots of issues that require political compromise. But what you don't find is anywhere in which a forum can be made to do so. So the the, it started maybe even with Jim Flaherty he said, I'm not meeting with the premiers anymore. I'm just going to give them, you know, an escalator rate on the budget every time we do it. Because every time we get together, all they do is whine and complain. But if you don't have those forums, which can constitute some kind of compromise and some kind of negotiating negotiation on the middle ground, then maybe a lot of the issues that people are concerned about never get discussed. So I, I leave you with this because we could go on for a long time. But I mean, we're 10 years away from the healthcare system dealing with the most incredible burden, and that is people like me who are going to be older and, you know, in our in our old age are going to burden the healthcare system. 
the greatest cost that's escalating for the federal government right now is old age pension. If you take a look at it, it is it is hammering away now at the deficit. It's squeezing out almost everything else. It's like a big like a big eclipse. Where is the discussion on this? Where is the discussion when the Ontario government says we need between thirty and forty thousand new PSWs in this province? Uh, to try and look after that population as we go forward. Where is the, you know, the multi-provincial national strategy to deal with these things and having people come together and say, we have a huge reckoning that I personally was talking about in 2012, my former colleague Daryl Bricker talks about in his books. And we got no forum to discuss these things. What we've got is narrow partisan politics. And that I think goes to your point. Back in those, quote, good old days, we happen to have people who felt that getting around the table to deal with these big issues, to show that leadership was worth doing. And what's happened since Carl Rove did that and to put out the book and, and tried to narrow cast everything, we've seen the change in strategy for political parties, plus the way in which communications happens in this country. And all we are are back to the shards and not the full pane of glass that we need to look through to see our future. So I, you know, part of this is politics. But the other part is we have no facility to bring people together to talk about these things for a common strategy, whether it be housing or how we look after the elderly. And that is the failure of the great politics of our time. We just don't have a voice anymore. We just scream and yell often in the dark. John Wright, Executive Vice President of Maori Public Opinion. I agree. Thank you so much for sharing with us. It's my pleasure. Take care. We're going to take a break and come back with a couple more comments in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody.